We are continuing our journey through Hammerland, uh, our official journey. As, as many of you might know, we started this a few years ago in an unofficial capacity, but now we're diving straight in. We're doing a year-long series on the Hammer film, specifically the Dracula and Frankenstein Hammer films. I'm joined once again by Aaron Christensen of Horror 101 with Dr. AC. How you doing, sir? I'm doing great, and I'm super excited to dive in, uh, dive in deeper. And uh, as I said, I think last week, the fun for me is like kind of waiting to see what you thought of each of these films, because I've known what I thought for a while. Um, but it'll be fun to see how you, uh, how these, how these uh, uh, sit with you. Um, let's start off with the horror of Dracula. I should, I should mention we are trying to go chronologically, starting from 1957 with the very first uh, Hammer horror film, which was The Curse of Frankenstein, which you talked about last week with uh, Peter Cushing, uh, last month with Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee. Uh, now we're in 1958. We're doing a double feature because there are actually two uh, Hammer monster films. The Horror of Dracula, a.k.a. Dracula in the UK, which you helped really <laughs> filled me in on because I looked for Dracula Hammer and nothing came up. There's just the, this horror of Dracula. I'm like, what's up with that? You, you set me straight. <laughs> um, and then The Revenge of Frankenstein, which is a direct sequel to the movie we talked about last month. But as far as the horror of Dracula, I had a, an extremely weird and awkward experience with this movie. Ooh. Do you remember watching this film with me back in 2019? Wait, we watched Horror of Dracula together? Yes, we did. <laughs> okay. I mean, I'm not, you, you could tell me anything happened in 2019. I'd be like, great. Um, you know what? I What was interesting was having watched it and going, um, but then again, you know, it's like, it's such a familiar uh film for me that you know it didn't it didn't surprise me that it seemed like I just watched this not too long ago you telling me that we watched it in 2019 I'm a little surprised at that but you, do you remember when it was it was August of 2019 and the only reason I know that is because yeah, why do you know that? I, I keep a spreadsheet a google doc of all the movies I watched in a given year and I started that in 2019 so it took me an hour longer to watch the horror of Dracula in the actual runtime because I kept pausing and going to the internet to think, to, to look up on my own website, kickseat.com, to see, okay, I know that this is familiar. Did I watch this with AC? Do we podcast about it? The answer is no. So I'm thinking we just watched this on one of our movie afternoons and just, I remember talking about it with you at your kitchen table specifically but we didn't record anything about it. That's so funny. I yeah. mean, I have no, I have no recollection of that. And I'm scanning my, uh, my, my spreadsheet as well. Um, and I didn't, I didn't see it, but that's, that's okay. I, I will believe, I do believe you. Um, well, what'd you think having watched it for the second time? <laughs> you know, it's, I feel I feel biased because it was so frustrating uh, watching it that I remember loving it the first time I saw it. Once I got back into the rhythm, I'm like, oh yeah, that's this cool thing happened and and all that. But because I was having this bizarre sense of deja vu, I just couldn't slip into it like I did the first time or with any of the other Dracula films. So I feel like this is probably gonna be the one that we talk about the the least uh, in in this particular episode. But you know, it's. Uh, Cushing coming off of playing Dr. Frankenstein and playing uh, doc, <laughs> playing Van Helsing uh, is quite a, quite a turn. He's going from this dreadful villain to the ultimate kind of hero in this horror lore. Uh, it's fun. And Christopher Lee, is he makes a fine Dracula. I just wish he'd had more, you know, in the beginning, he's got a lot of, you know, good lines. A lot of presence and then by the end he's just kind of like howling and scowling and jumping about you know doing in perfectly good Christopher Lee fashion but uh, I feel like we've seen more of him in other movies that we've talked about uh, so this was kind of a I had to rewind the tape and be like yeah this is their first outing it's also more of a straight adaptation of Dracula with some twists but it's very very formal feeling very stiff very proper and I thought I was going crazy, but then the next, the day after I watched this, I put on Revenge of Frankenstein, which is a completely 
loose and fun kind of lived in horror gothic drama farce that I was like, no, that's that's what I was missing from horror of Dracula. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, well, uh, because what, um, well, we'll talk about Dracula first. Um, just the, uh, the context was, yes, uh, it, it was born of, you know, uh, Curse of Frankenstein had met with success. They immediately said, we got to get the second one going. And this one had um, Universal's blessing. Universal was actually going to be the distributor from the get-go because Universal had the rights to the literary character at that time. Whoa. Um, the, I think it went into the public domain, uh, the, the novel went into the public domain in 1962 or 63, somewhere around there. And you'll notice that suddenly there's a lot more Dracula films. If you look prior to that, there actually aren't that many of them uh, because, because Universal had to have the say. Uh, AIP, when they would do things, they did them under the Universal banner. Um, so, uh, but I, I, uh, that was something I hadn't, I hadn't been aware of that from the very beginning, Universal was in on it. They were like, great. Uh, not only did you do a, a nice job with Curse of Frankenstein, this time we will benefit directly from it. <laughs> um, and it was the first time that uh, this novel that takes place you know, in London, in England, uh, this was the first time that an Englishman had played Dracula. We'd had Bill Lugosi. Um, we'd had uh, um, there was one other one other person who had who had uh, also played it, but oh oh uh, Germany uh, Nosferatu. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. But this was the first time that an Englishman had actually played, you know, uh, Dracula. Uh, and Lee, you know, Lee was a known quantity, but this is the one that made him a star. I can see that because well, a he's actually allowed to give a more traditional performance aside from just being the, the kind of the silent monster from the previous film. But um, yeah, it's, I, you know, when he's interacting with Jonathan Harker, who comes to the castle is almost like an, an agent of Van Helsing, which was a nice little wrinkle. Right. Now I have not read the novel Dracula. I've not seen the original universal pictures film. I'm you know, going to fix that this year. Um, so I don't know how much of that was the invention of this particular movie, but it was sort of new to me. I mean, my frame of reference is Bram Stoker's Dracula, the Francis Ford Coppola movie. And that certainly wasn't the case, you know, in that, in that regard. Um, but it's, I, I like the surprise of Harker going to this castle. You realize that he is sort of setting a trap with you know, Van Helsing as his backup, but uh, things don't work out so well for him. And the ostensible hero of this movie doesn't make it very far. Uh, right. Comes to a really gruesome, chilling end. The one thing that I really, I don't even remember it from the first time I watched it, but it really struck me this time when he goes down into the crypt to take out um, the vampire lady who, um, Valerie Gaunt, who we saw in you know, the, the previous uh, film, the Frankenstein movie, you know, she pops up again. She's very lovely. Um, I didn't know who she was the first time we watched it, but now again, since we're going on this journey, I'm starting to pick up these frames of reference and it's very cool. He stakes her through the heart while she's sleeping. This awakens Dracula. He disappears so that when Harker goes over to Dracula's coffin, there's nobody in there, but then he looks up and he sees Dracula coming through the door and he's barring the door. And it's very specific that he is standing between Jonathan Harker and freedom. Uh, and as he backs away against the wall, it's just, I was just imagining myself down there and how terrifying that must feel. So yeah, bravo. But then when Cushing comes into the picture and he's dealing with the, family of uh, Harker's fiance and then his, was it her sister or her friend? I, I get the, the Mina Lucy thing kind of mixed up, but uh, you know, it, it becomes more about the, the gadgetry, I think, and the, the fun of watching Van Helsing use his old school instruments, like um, the, uh, the dictaphone and the, the stethoscope. There was a bit of comedy, what I perceive as comedy. I don't know if this is intentional or not, but he's visiting a patient who's having some kind of like chest pains or, or, you know, some kind of a problem. He has to like listen to her heart. He uses this new contraption. It's like a, a copper 
funnel, essentially, like an old school, like an old stethoscope. And the lady who's with the woman he's treating is like, oh, aren't you just going to put your head to her heart? And he's like, well, I've got this thing. It doesn't quite work out. So he ends up putting his head to her chest. It just seems like an invention that was meant to A, be more accurate and B, be less invasive. <laughs> Um, and I was like, that was oh. actually from just that, that to clarify that was that was from Revenge of the Revenge of Frankenstein that uh, use of the stethoscope. Was that? Oh, oh that, my that, gosh, that Frankenstein. But that's okay. I mean, you know. Um, I'm sorry. I'm yeah. I'm getting my movies mixed up. I just watched one of them this morning at four o'clock, which probably explains it. Watched them very close together. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I agree. And uh, what's interesting is that uh, the dictaphone and the blood transfusion and things like that, those were all kind of cutting edge when Stoker wrote the novel. Just to back up really quick, um, Jimmy Sangster, who had also written the screenplay for Curse of Frankenstein, he does the adaptation here. And that was kind of his, uh, he was tasked by the, um, by the producer, Anthony Hines, to truncate everything as much as possible, to make it very compact. So, uh, Everything is everything is very very much in the same neighborhood, uh, you know. Like the the, the his his um, his castle is not a huge sea voyage as it is in the novel, but it's a mere carriage ride away. Um, but I think that's kind of the genius of Sankster's screenplay is that he does bring everything together and he tells everything very quickly. Um, by turning Harker into a, 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 an agent of Van Helsing's, you know, we, we lose the librarian aspect who has to then, we you know, we didn't need to bring it. It's like, we're bringing it right into the fray. We know why he's there and there's inherent dramatic conflict from the very beginning. Um, and, you know, what's, what's fascinating is, you know, especially at the very beginning, Hammer was always very tight with their purse strings and so economy was the, the name of the game. Uh, and I wish I'd, I wish I'd thought to talk to you beforehand, but that, uh, that set, that stage one that they use, they redressed, Bernard Robinson, production designer, redressed that set about seven different times. It's the same set. And when you go back and watch it again, keep your eye on the staircase because the staircase is always there. There's all sorts of street <laughs> covering it, there's drapes, but like in the crypt, that staircase is the same staircase that he runs up at the end, up into the library. The library has the same staircase. That front room has the same staircase. Out back in the graveyard has the same staircase. Oh my God. It's amazing, and I had never realized that prior to this viewing. I had, somebody had just told, John Kitley told me, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, it's it's the same set over and over and over again." But you, I mean, I've seen this movie like maybe seven, eight times, and I, that has never occurred to me before. So, for everybody else out there watching it, keep your eye on the staircase, and just keep going. Yep, that's stage one, and that's stage one, and that's stage one again, and stage one. See, now I I don't know that I wanted to know that information, but thank you. It's kind of like, have we talked about the uh, the arrow on the FedEx logo? No, we have not. <laughs> uh, I'll have to send this to you later, but for anyone out there, Google real quick FedEx logo, bring it, bring it up in your images and find the arrow. It's a white arrow in the logo. Once you see it, you will never be able to see the FedEx logo in the same way again. You will just see the arrow. Um, but no, that's 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 a cool thing, and it does... Even though I'm complaining about having watched something that I feel like I just saw because I did, um, I feel like I'm going to be going back to revisit uh, Horror of Dracula because it is quite a remarkable film. And I really did enjoy the climax of it when it's Van Helsing versus uh, Dracula. Um, the, the use of the sunlight, the use of those giant metal candlesticks that he smashes together to create a crucifix. Um, the one thing that didn't quite work for me. I remember this being a criticism the first time I saw it is when Dracula melts his face. I, he's got like these golden little ruby, like gem eyes almost mm. and the fangs, but it's all covered under this ash. And it looks like 
an ashy Muppet cat or something. <laughs> it was just kind of cuddly and cute and not horrifying like I've seen in other melted vampire pictures. Well, fun little fact on that is that um, I watched, uh, the, I forget who put it out, my apologies, but um, in, there's a 2012 restoration because there were a couple of scenes that were cut out of the original release by the British censors that have since been reintegrated. One of which being there in that final scene where uh, Van Helsing forces Dracula into the sunlight and he begins to disintegrate there was a thing where he reached up with his hand and like kind of clawed his face, his hand down his face. And you saw like it kind of like digging into layers of flesh. Mm. And you don't get to see that in the, the cut version, but that's been reinstated since. And that, I think that provides a, a smoother transition from the flesh Dracula and the, the dusty Dracula at the end, the one that you were just uh, referring to. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I saw the 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 flesh bit. It, it, so it's a special cut. It, where can it's, I? It's a it's a newly remastered version from 2012 uh, that reinstates some of the cut footage that had been shot and then uh, removed at the censor's request. Is that on Blu-ray or something? Or it is, and okay. I will I will conjure that for you before uh, before we leave. Okay. Um, um, but I did want. I also want to throw in that the the, the referring to the climax, um, Cushing was initially supposed to pull out a crucifix and show that to Lee and force him into the sunlight. And Cushing had already produced two crucifixes already, and he said, "What is he a crucifix salesman?" So that was Cushing's idea to come up with the candlestick, creating the uh, the the cross. As was, it was Cushing's idea to have him run down the, run down the, the table and jump on the drapes and pull down the, the drapes to reveal the sunlight. I, you know, watching that moment, it's, it's a spectacular moment, but it reminded me of Gremlins. And I wondered if Joe Dante might have been kind of paying homage to that when Gizmo flies up to the tarp to, you know, let oh. the sunlight in to destroy Stripe. I would say 100% that is a reference, a direct reference. Because <laughs> I know... Christopher Lee showed up in Gremlins 2, the new batch, as uh, Dr. <laughs> Catheter. Um, <laughs> but, um, and, you know, we should also mention, um, I know people for years have pronounced this actor's name Michael Goh, uh, Alfred from Batman, from the, from the Tim Burton Batman movies. But I listened to Joel Schumacher's audio commentary, I think on Batman and Robin or Batman Forever, for whatever reason, it was, I was desperate for content. And he kept referring to him as Michael Goff. Have you ever heard that pronunciation? That's correct. Like, like cough. Yeah. I, it's, I don't know. I, I don't know which one I like better. I like Goff better, of course, because it's proper and you got to right. be respectful, but right. so you got go, it just sounds more English. Whereas Goff, yeah, it just sounds like scoff or cough. <laughs> <laughs> Again, no disrespect. And what and what do you think of Michael Guff's performance? Because he takes a lot of heat for this film. Like uh, he he's often described as the weak link in the in the film, um, and uh, and it, that this film didn't do him any favors in terms of. And he'd already you know he'd been a he'd been acting in films for I think ten years at that point, and uh, so like for him for him to be in it I, I think. Some people think that he felt he was above the material. Um, but I actually, I mean, again, if you read reviews, uh, a lot of people really take issue with his performance as Arthur. And I've never had a real problem with it. I think it's a perfectly competent performance. And yes, there are times when it's a little uh, gestorial where he's doing some big, you know, big grieving moments. Um, but, uh, but, for me, you know, it's it, at the end of the day, it's a melodrama, and I feel like he is appropriately melodramatic. Yeah, I mean, I there's nothing that stands out to me. I didn't know that criticism before watching the movie either time, so it just struck me as I, I can't put my head in the myself in the head of someone at the time who would have seen Michael Goff in this movie, and that's probably a strike against the performance right there. Like, what are you doing in this, you know, schlock? But then, as far as the performance, I think it was fine. It could have been anybody doing this role, 
I don't think it was a disservice, you know, to the movie or anything that he was doing it. He was just, you know, he was he was all right. He was kind of like he ended up becoming Van Helsing's sidekick uh, towards the end as the the father of uh, someone whose family was you know being victimized by Dracula and he's trying to help out. You know, it was a good performance. Yeah. And so, I think I mean, if anything, his his biggest issue is that he's acting opposite Cushing. And I think Cushing is just in top form in this film. I think it's it's one of my favorite uh, performances of his alongside uh, his role as Van Helsing in uh, Brides of Dracula, which we talked about before. I think he really does it because I think Cushing, as, as great as he is as Frankenstein, I love like there's just a sense of nobility. I think that, you know, like for Cushing, Cushing is the good guy and Lee is the bad guy. And while they did occasionally switch sides, you know, um, I think there's a reason why they became typecast in those roles, uh, the force of good and the force of evil, because there's just kind of an inherent decency to Cushing. And when you put, you know, that, that sense of drive and purpose that he brings to Van Helsing, I, I just find it uh, fascinating and, and completely watchable. Yeah. I mean, he's, we've, I feel like this Hammerland series is going to become just <laughs> the rename it the Peter Cushing love fest because he is yep. amazing. Um, and yeah, I, I like that, uh, that he's able to take on both of these kinds of roles and excel at both of them. I'm kind of leaning towards the Frankenstein as far as my, my preferred, you know, character of his, but you bring up a good point in relation to Michael Goff, which is, and this is just speculation on my part. If people were not thrilled about his, performance perhaps it was because he was trying to step aside and not take away anything from Peter Cushing's role because he is the star Goff is playing the the reluctant sidekick who's you know you don't think he's going to be in the movie more than two minutes until he is he's drawn into it by circumstance so that that's a perfectly acceptable thing to kind of step back and and you know just do your part <laughs> you know? um, right. not like I'm the great Michael Goff and I'm in this vampire film it's mine no <laughs> Pardon the bad impression. That was a great Michael Guff perform uh, uh, <laughs> impression, by the way. <laughs> you're too kind. Um, so you're, anything else to say about the horror of Dracula? I mean, we'll probably weave back around to it while talking Frankenstein, but uh, anything before we well, jump I mean, over? I, have, yeah, I, think, I think it is, uh, it's considered by many kind of to be one of the most important uh, Hammer films because it really did get the ball rolling. It was the one-two punch in the same way that uh, Dracula and Frankenstein were the one-two punch for Universal. Uh, both came out in 1931. These two films for, came out within, I think, nine months of each other for, um, for Hammer. And they became kind of like what the uh, studio became identified with. Fun fact, uh, Horror of Dracula had its world premiere in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Of all no. Really? It, it premiered there, I think, like a week or two before it played in the, U, in the UK. And again, that was because Universal um, had, their, had their distribution deal. So yes, it opened in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Were Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee like stomping around Milwaukee, like going to the red carpet and finding a local pub yeah. or something? I, you know what? I, if that's not true, I want it to be. I want there to be a... This is going to sound offensive, but it's the best analogy I can come up with. I want there to be a one night in Miami style movie about the premiere night. Right. Of, yes. Of oh, this man. Movie. <laughs> Let's do that. Let's do that. Oh, man. Um, so, okay. So, yeah, we've got Christopher Lee, Peter Cushing, Michael Goff, and who would be the fourth? <laughs> like, well, legend. probably Terrence Fisher, right? Yes. Um, but, and, and, you know, it's remarkable because he did. Uh, Curse of Frankenstein, Revenge of Frankenstein, Horror of Dracula, all within the course of, I mean, these were released a year apart, but he was just churning through this stuff. It's its quite incredible. The fact that they are all fantastic movies for different reasons is, you know, quite remarkable. And I, I think that brings us neatly to Revenge of Frankenstein. Uh, the, I love this movie. Um, I love Horror of Dracula in its own way, but again, I think I was more impressed with it the first time I saw it because it was very new and I was trying to get over myself during the second viewing. But as far as Revenge of Frankenstein goes, it does what I love about all sequels, which is you get the origin film. 
and it's kind of standard kind of rote. We've been there, but in the sequel, you've got a lot more room to breathe because you don't have to go establishing or reestablishing things again. And we start off at the very end, essentially, of the previous movie where uh, Dr. Frankenstein is being uh, set, set to be executed. We open with a beautiful shot of the guillotine. <laughs> That's the credits play over the guillotine. One thing I need your help on, though. <laughs> there is a character named Carl yes. who is at the execution, and he helps to orchestrate Frankenstein's escape. Was he at the end of the previous film? Or is that an invention of this movie? Okay. Or did or maybe he was we, there and we just we didn't never, see it? I don't remember it. No, no. We 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 were left with Curse of Frankenstein thinking that he and the, the priest are gonna ascend the scaffolding together and only one of them will come back down. Okay. How how Carl ended up in the equation, I have no idea. <laughs> okay, so it starts with a bit of a retcon, but that's fine because it's a great little switcheroo there um, with uh, Frankenstein kind of faking his own death. And there's, there's actually the, the priest's body ends up in that grave. Uh, and then we've got these two kind of drunken barflies who decide to go dig up the body in the cemetery and they discover the secret. Um, but uh, one of them runs away, right? And it's the second one who kind of gets confronted and this is what I mean about the, the playfulness and the fun kind of tone of this movie. It's established in the bar that the one guy has a heart condition. Right. <laughs> He's like, I've got a weak heart. I'm, you know, this guy's paying us 10 kroners or whatever ten, to go. Ten, and, marks. ten, ten marks. marks. Yeah. To go dig up this body. Uh, and he has to convince his friend. They go to the cemetery. They realize that the body in there is not Frankenstein. And in fact, Frankenstein shows up and says, I'm Dr. Frankenstein guy has a heart attack and falls back into the grave <laughs> well what's funny is it's like that that uh body i think is the one that ends up in the laboratory and i don't and i don't know if they used the priest's body or if they used the old drunk's body i wondered about that because i i'd have to go back and and look because the body is very distinct but I don't remember, I, I don't know if it looks enough like the, the barfly guy to, you know, it might be the case, but I just, I imagine them being different people. Yeah. Well, it's, he's, he's, he's certainly lean and, and uh, uh, more, more shape, uh, more shaped like Cushing than the, the, um, the priest was. True. And what I really dig about this movie is even more so than Curse of Frankenstein. This movie is about Dr. Frankenstein. Uh, even to the point where we get to the monster. Last time we had Christopher Lee as this like putty, pussy amalgam of different people. In this one, Frankenstein has really kind of learned his lesson. He's spent three years in a different village doing, you know, an act, a legit medical practice. He's become very popular. Uh, but then he also does charity work at the hospital where he gets the parts to do his, you know, nasty deeds in the lab. But he's really trying to perfect this idea of a creature to the point where this new body that he has, there's very light scarring. It looks like a fully formed kind of a beautiful young man. So he's not just hacking limbs off. You get the feeling he's doing like cosmetic surgery and, you know, fine stitching and things like that to get it just right. Um, he gets a new uh, assistant named, is it Clev, Cleva or Cleaver? I can't. That's Carl. Carl's his assistant. No, I mean, sorry, the, the new the new doctor. Carl oh, right. Carl's yeah, yeah. like the, the lab assistant. I'm talking about the, the partner, I should say, yeah. Right. I don't remember his name offhand. Yeah, I thought it was like Clev, but yeah, that, that doesn't sound that right. right. I mean, I'm sure there's, a, there's certainly a Clev uh, at some point in the hammer, because why would there be? <laughs> oh, I really should know this, but again, four o'clock in the morning. Um, and I even took notes, but I can't really read them right now uh, because it's illegible and rude to do so on a, on a podcast. Yes, it is. It is. It is Cleve. Uh, K-L-E-V-E. -E. Okay. Cleve. Oh, so, but he is the, in Curse of Frankenstein, you had a doctor who came to, I guess, teach 
young, recently sort of orphaned Frankenstein. And he realized the power of this kid's genius and ended up just kind of like sticking with him until he could no longer help him out because of moral reasons. He found out what he was up to. This guy, uh, Cleve, is a local doctor who is a part of that medical council. They had this big meeting to discuss the problem of Frankenstein. He's stealing everybody's patients. He's wildly popular and he refuses to join their guild partially. And I love this because when he first showed up into town three years ago, he asked, can I be part of this guild? And they're like, who are you? Go away. So he right. did. <laughs> um, but Cleve figures out uh, that Frankenstein is the Frankenstein of this horrible legend from a few years ago, the one who created the monster and then disappeared um, or is allegedly executed, sort of uses blackmail against him, but he really just wants to help and be involved in these experiments and see where they go. So it's a completely different kind of partnership than the one that we saw in the previous film all the way up through the very end, which I love, taking these familiar elements and really going different places with them. I agree, I agree. Um... I mean, what, what's funny is, uh, as you said, you know, it's a very different kind of monster this time around. Although he does still kind of piecemeal together a body uh, that he will use at the very end uh, from these uh, working in the poor the poorhouse, the, the hospital, just kind of like collecting limbs here and there uh, that he... He, he lops off of the unfortunates uh, that are kind of like, yeah, that, that arm's going to have to go. And he's like, what, really? Wait, why? Well, but, but to that, to that end, to, to finish that little exchange, he says that arm's got to go. And he says, you can't take, you can't take his arm. It'll ruin his, his career. And he says, well, what's his profession? He says, pickpocket. <laughs> <But I'm bumps. laughs> well, and, and you, you, you do point, like there's a lot more kind of play uh, in this film, as opposed, Curse of Frankenstein is a pretty much a very straightforward, sober affair. This one has a little. Uh, you referred to the um, the listening. To, you know, he does he does have to put his ear to the chest of a a young eligible maiden uh, at the the urging of her mother yeah. because she would like to see uh, her her daughter married off to this this fine man. So you know, we, we see we see a lot of, of little um, the the, uh, the the two drunks that end up digging up the grave. One of them is Michael Ripper, and you're going to see a lot of him. Uh, he is one of the uh, one of the stalwarts of Hammer Horror. He always shows up in little bit parts. Uh, it's kind of like the Where's Waldo of Hammer, <laughs> because you're always going to go, oh, there he is. Now it's a Hammer film. Uh, but yeah, he was. He plays the the more drunken of them, uh, not the one with the heart condition, but the other one. Mm. So the smart one. The, plenty of him. Yeah, you'll see more of him to come. <laughs> well, okay, so there is a um, a lovely young lady, uh, Miss Conrad, who volunteers, or I guess she's getting paid, uh, but to work you know for Frankenstein at the hospital, like caring for the patients, bring them like snacks and <laughs> just tending to their needs uh she ends up causing a lot of trouble inadvertently as happened with horror of dracula honestly with like the house the uh the housekeeper who's you know oh my dear you're you're so hot let's open the window <laughs> let some fresh air and and vampires okay, right. um but the thing is with uh with miss conrad she becomes this, not the damsel in distress. She's got her own life and her own thing going on, completely separate from what's happening with uh, Cleve and Frankenstein. Another thing that I absolutely loved, uh, which is you know kind of underscored by this high society dinner that's hap that happens later in the film. Any other film, I feel like they would have all been going to this thing together, but they just happen. They need some information, so they go and track her down. She's like, "No, I'm I'm here with with my friends. What are you doing here?" <laughs> And and because because Revenge of Frankenstein is an original story, I suppose a little plot recap is in order. Mm -hmm. um, you've got Carl, uh, who is uh, Frankenstein's assistant, and he has uh, issues with his eye. He's got a curl a curled hand. He's got a limp. Basically, he's a mess. And uh, uh, Frankenstein has promised to get him a new body, uh, so they're going to do a brain transplant. And so they, uh, they 
They, that's what the, he and Cleve set out to do. They get the two bodies, take one brain, stick it in the other body. And uh, that becomes the new Carl, uh, played by Michael Gwynn. And, uh, and what happens is that, uh, you know, it's, it's a success, but much like his previous success, there's, you know, it's gonna, something has to go wrong. And in this case, a sadistic janitor uh, beats him soundly about the, the head, which presumably causes brain damage and causes his body to revert back to its uh, slope-eyed and, um, you know, uh, uh, gammy hand uh, of, of his former, which I think is an, it's an interesting leap. Um, I'm kind of like, well, because Frankenstein says it's not brain damage that caused the deficiencies in Carl, that it was, you know, uh, that the it blood was blood clot. Yeah. That it was physical. Exactly. So it's, it's one of those things I kind of like go, that's fun, but you've, you know, it's not necessarily playing by the rules that you've laid out. Unless, because that, that's an excellent point, but what I'm wondering, because what I took from it was they make direct reference to what went wrong with Curse of Frankenstein with the original creature, which was essentially that the, the brain and the bag got dropped and they picked yeah. it up and they still and they, used it anyway. And they got a bullet put through it. That's true. Um, but in this, this case, yeah, everything goes fine until that janitor beats the crap out of Frankenstein. I got the idea that you know, if a blood clot can do that to a body, then he, Frankenstein escapes from the room that, that the kind of recovery room that he's in. So he hasn't had a full chance. He's only been kind of like walking around for a day or two by the time he gets out. So his brain doesn't know how his body, they're still trying to figure each other out. Yep. So I can see how getting this, this trauma not necessarily that I buy, to your point, that he goes back to being exactly the same Carl as before, but I can see how that would kind of drive his system a little bit crazy and his body starting yeah. to break down. It could just be a coincidence that his body starts rejecting its own self in ways that mirrored what happened with Carl. Yeah, and I think that's just, again, it's it's a fun little horror trope, um, but it, it's something that, you know, logically really is a it's quite a leap um and and but you know it, it also allows uh the creature to confront its creator you know um when he shows up at that party and as as in the case of the original frankenstein novel you know the creator rejects his creation and you know to his own well not to his own detriment, because what happens to Dr. Frankenstein is sort of unrelated to what happens to the creature, uh, but it is a fantastic comeuppance. One thing I want to mention before we get, because we're kind of moving towards the climax, but I want to rewind a bit yeah. to talk about Michael Gwynn's performance. Um, he's given a real yeah. chance to act and be a person uh, instead of just this mindless monster. The brain transplant works ostensibly perfectly because it's his brain in this new body, which is quite a nice, you know, robust physical form. Uh, he's, you know, you see the thrashing about and the kind of confusion initially as you would, but when he, especially when he's talking to, uh, to Ms. Conrad, I believe, uh, and also to, to Cleve, not so much Frankenstein, cause he's still a bastard, but when he's interacting with people, he's having conversations, he's expressing himself. There's a lovely moment where Cleve is trying to, as Frankenstein has ordered him, keep the subject engaged, keep him awake, keep him talking. So he's like, oh yeah, the experiment went great. And when we tell all the scientists of the world, you're gonna be famous. People are gonna come from all around to look at you. And Carl says, he starts to panic. He's like, all my life people have been looking at me. I wanna be left alone. This beautiful switcheroo of context of what does it mean to be looked at? Right, uh, you know. right, well, that's, that's a great, that's a great observation. Um, Fun, fun. Uh, Michael Gwynn would actually show up uh, later in in uh, Scars of Dracula. He plays uh, the ineffectual priest um, who gets attacked by the bats. <laughs> I don't know if you remember this, but we'll we'll come back around to him. Be, you know, in a, in a few years, uh, he will be once again in uh, in Hammerland. Awesome. Uh, and also, Eunice. 
Eunice Gason, who plays um, who plays Miss Conrad, uh, she is actually one of the first Bond girls. She played Sylvia Trench in uh, Doctor No. That's a movie I think so I'm, I might stopped, actually watch this year. I was thinking about wa yeah, watching James Bond. Yeah, you will you will see a familiar face. <laughs> um, but yeah, Michael Gwynn was great. It, it it's unfortunate. I mean, I like that his character arc uh, is such that he goes from you know being sort of uh, you know deformed to becoming the more ideal version that he's always wanted to kind of regressing. It's a nice tragic story except when he begins regressing and he starts like slobbering and kind of like going into monster mode because that's what a monster movie requires. Yep. He looked a lot like Michael Palin from Monty Python. I couldn't get that in my head. It just sort of <laughs> giggle when he's attacking uh, like that, the, the lady that's, you know, she's left her lover in the dark and encounters Frankenstein at the bottom of the stairs uh, or Carl, I should say. That was just a little bit too funny for me. Um, but I like where it goes. I also like what happens to Dr. Frankenstein after his creature dies, he's under suspicion and under investigation. He seems completely unbothered by, <laughs> by he's like, yeah, I've got, I've got plans. This will, you know, if it blows over, it does. If not, I got a backup plan, but he's making his rounds by himself through the hospital ward uh, of the downtrodden that he's been using for experiments. And they're all onto him. Now they know which Frankenstein he is they beat the crap out of him. <laughs> and it's shocking when Cleve comes in, rescues Frankenstein and puts him up on the bed, just how wounded and sickly Peter Cushing looks. It looks as if he lost 60 pounds and then they put him in a bunch of like fright makeup. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, a, and it's a great, um, I mean, you know, what, what ultimately ends up happening and how, you know, how we can see how the series is gonna continue um, it's again, it's a fun, ridiculous, but fun uh, little conceit. It is, you know, I don't know. I guess we can leave the ending ultimately for people who haven't seen it yet to discover for themselves. So I think they'd absolutely should. But what I will say is Frankenstein, and this is why I think I love this iteration of Peter Cushing more than the others that I've seen is that his character is irredeemable. He's a bastard. He's killing people for his own you know, mad scientist ends. But there's a big part of me that understands all this and still really wants to see him succeed. It's like he gets closer and closer every movie. It's like, he's almost there. <laughs> so close. Well, somebody points out, uh, I was reading a, a write-up and uh, somebody points out that this movie is actually the first one in which the transplant is successful like the final final transplant is successful and it's like oh yeah i guess that's that's kind of true um i do think that like frankenstein need to do it just a he need, he need to work just a little harder in terms of his uh secret identities because to go from dr Frick, Vic, dr victor frankenstein to dr victor stein it's not a huge yeah i mean Come on, put in a little effort here, pal. Well, but it is kind of like that Freddy Krueger thing of every town has an Elm Street. Because uh, <laughs> a couple of times when he's questioned about this, he's like, yeah, there's Frankensteins all over the place. So you know, Frankensteins. every yeah. city across Europe has a family. And yeah, I'm a baron too, or something like that. <laughs> but I also, I dig that you never get this feeling that he's sweating it. He either right. thinks he's way smarter than anybody who's questioning him, which he probably is, or he's like, this is, you know, he's the Elon Musk of, you know, uh, of diabolical plans. He's got backups for his backups. And I think that's, I think that's something you're going to appreciate as, as time goes on, because Dr. Frankenstein gets in hot water all the time and you will never see him sweat. He's always like, it's fine. I'm going to be fine. <laughs> I'm fine. You're ridiculous. You're a moron. I'm brilliant. Moving on. So uh, tell me, does, because he, we've got a few more Frankenstein films to go, I'm assuming with Peter Cushing. Yes. Do they start to drop off at a different point or are we going to be going up and up and up for a while? So <clears throat> by and large, the biggest drop off is our next film, Evil of Frankenstein. Hmm. Um, 
I think it is uh, unfairly maligned. And so I'm looking forward to defending it uh, in some respect. Um, but we'll save that for another day. But no, I think that uh, I think that the Frankensteins, again, with the exception of Evil of Frankenstein, which has some some it has some issues, but I feel like uh, the Frankensteins are uniformly strong, whereas the Draculas, eh, it's another story. <laughs> All right. Now we haven't talked about the kind of the behind the scene, not behind the scene stuff, but the the non story part of the film. Uh, as far as like the direction and the production design, certainly to the degree we talked about with Horror of Dracula. Um, you know, I maybe I'm just a sucker for the Frankenstein labs more than I am the fancy vampire crypts. But, you know, again, he's got the coolest equipment. He's got this, it was like a five minute scene that in any other context would have felt like padding. But mm -hmm. we get to see the electronic brain <laughs> that he has cooked up. <laughs> A machine hooked up to an arm, <laughs> hooked up to a pair of eyes. And he's just showing this off to to Cleve as his sort of first tour around the lab. And like, I love that I can watch an entire movie of Peter Cushing explains diabolical science. Yep. And how he goes around the room kind of flicking different switches. And I'm kind of like, I don't think any of that actually has anything to do with what you're doing. You're just showing off now. <laughs> um, I, I was thinking about that. I think go back and watch it because I could kind of see it's almost like he's setting a little Rube Goldberg thing. Cause I think one is like a fan and the next there's something moving. I, I feel like that makes sense, not scientifically, but there's something going on. <laughs> now I will say now that we're kind of at the end of this is actually not one of my favorite Frankensteins. Wow. Um, really? Right. And I, and I, I want you to have your experience of it. Um, I, I think I just find it a little silly. I find it it has a it has a little bit of the case of the cutes, yeah. Um, and and that's you know I like I like my my Frankenstein straight up no chaser. Um, <laughs> and and uh, so I mean the fact that we have you know like we have those I I, de I defy anybody to look at the the scene with the eyeballs kind of moving around and not laugh. Um, and again, I feel like that was the intent was that, you know, we're going to add a little levity to the, to the proceedings. But for my money, again, the, there's, there's a few, there's a few too many asks uh, of me as an audience member to just kind of like go along with it. Um, so this is not, this is not necessarily one of my favorites. Uh, and, you know, it, 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 it's recognized as, you know, I, I find that it's perfectly serviceable um but it is it's not one i return to time and again well okay we are going to have our differences of opinion here i think we both appreciate the movie i i'm head over heels for this thing sure. now i have not seen the other frankenstein movies so perhaps in comparison to that uh, to those movies this would you know maybe i'll look back and I'll be like yeah there, there was stuff missing that i didn't even know i was missing um to the to the eyeball thing it is funny but i think it also serves uh, a crucial part to the story w because what when Cleve asks him about like why you know this is amazing he's never seen anything like it and Frankenstein's yeah but it's a failure because I realized that no machine can replicate what you know the, the the mysteries of the human body because you could say like why don't you just build a robot or something <laughs> out of these parts and you know use electricity and, and wiring to make a, the superhuman uh, but the body is sort of the perfect, uh, the perfect natural robot uh, yeah. that he's trying to figure out. So yeah, I like the exploration. I do like the silliness because I think it's not, it's not camp. It's just yeah, cute no, is I, the right word. Agree. It's uh, yeah. It's it's not camp. It's not camp at all. There's no winking going on. It's just you know, it's it's comic relief for its own sake. And the, and, the, and again, that's fine. And I think it really is just personal preference. Uh, mm. It's. It's, it's not, you know, I'm kind of like, okay, okay, I, good job, get on with it. <laughs> cool. So we're, are we talking about, uh, is Evil of Frankenstein next month? Is that the next one on the list? I believe. Or do we have or, a Dracula? I could be. I, it won't. Well, Brides of Dracula came in 1960. And so I think what we're, what we're moving into next, because, uh, they did, uh, the thing is like, they took a little break from uh, 
Lee, Lee took a very long break from playing uh, Dracula. He did not come back until 1965, I believe, is when 65 or 64 is when Dracula, Prince of Darkness came out. And so Evil of Frankenstein is 1964. So we will either be talking about it next or let me just see when Dracula, Prince of Darkness was. 66. So yes, Evil hmm. of Frankenstein will be next. Okay, and there's not a Dracula in there. What was Hammer just were they putting out different films at this point because well, of the successes was, of these? The thing was that Lee did not want to come back and play Dracula. And so that's why he, you know, he took 8 years basically um, between uh, Horror of Dracula and Dracula Prince of Darkness. Um, but there was there was Brides of Dracula with Cushing there was Kiss of the Vampire in 63. So they were trying to do other vampire movies. They just, they weren't a legit Dracula movie. Okay. That's kind of what I was getting at. Cause we're, we're kind of sticking to the name brand uh, <laughs> Monsters with Hammer. I just, and, and maybe this is something to, to end on with the successes of these uh, three films that we've talked about within the course of a year. Um, how did this send Hammer into overdrive or, you know, when how much content were they content how many movies were they putting out uh, after this period it was i mean it was definitely uh it started the hammer horror machine uh in in earnest um they had toyed around with some sci-fi uh they you know they 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 were i mean they were a full-blooded pardon the expression full-blooded studio and doing all sorts of genres but this is the one that really put them on the map internationally and so it became kind of what they be, they were identified with which was this gothic horror but you know when you dig deeper into hammer you're going to find that you know they did they did thrillers and they did black and white you know kind of like psycho ripoffs and you know there was there was a there was a lot more to hammer than just the gothic hammer um frankensteins and draculas but those tend to be a lot of people's entry point into hammer so I'm, kind of, I'm glad we're taking the journey that we are, and uh, it'll be fun to actually uh, step off the path from time to time and, you know, check out what else Hammer had to offer. Yeah, well, I'm definitely, uh, I'm glad you're along for the ride. How long are we going to take, how deep are we going to take this metaphor? Um, but uh, anyway, thank you again for talking about a movie we've already talked about, but it was good revisiting again, and a movie we haven't talked about, and uh, you know, I'm deadly curious to find about find out about these other Frankenstein films because, uh, yeah, Cushing, this has become one of my favorite characters and one of my favorite actors. So, uh, yeah, we'll be back next month with some more Hammerland. And until then, you are Aaron Christensen, once again, of uh, Horror 101 with Dr. AC. Be sure and check that out. There'll be a link below. Uh, I'm Ian Simmons, as always, from Kicking the Seat. If you liked this video, please like and subscribe and all that good stuff. And uh, we'll catch you next time. We gotta come up with a great little cute outing, like uh, like a an outro, a, a catchphrase. What do you, what do you think? We do. I, I I think we need to come up with it because it's not gonna happen right now. No, like you've been hammered, or no, <laughs> no. Great, that's it. No, that's it. <laughs> no, that's not it. We'll we'll think well, of something next month. It is hammer time. That's probably we're gonna get a copyright strike if if you keep that up. No, we won't. Anyway, take care, man. I'll talk to you next month. Adios. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>